Uh, thanks. We're a couple minutes early. That's unusual. That's great. Uh, we're just doing a, a little tour with uh, Bill McNair, uh, looking at the problems of shoaling at the harbor entrance on the river, and then we a little jaunt further up the river to talk about gravel movement. Uh, and earlier today, we are up in uh, Port Orford. Uh, finally, after a number of years of delay, we are reconstructing uh, the breakwater there. Uh, so that's right in the theme of my visit to the, uh, the coast this week, which is uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, you know, we're pretty mo uh, remote from lots of parts of my district in Oregon, and uh, you know, we have uh, we have needs down here that are somewhat unique, uh, particularly uh, with our harbors. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, harbors. We're gonna talk about uh, highways a little bit. Um, uh, airports, uh, and you know, your nearest airport is a ways away for commercial travel, uh, and a couple other things I'm working on, and then uh, we're going to hear from uh, some of the people actually doing the work uh, with the federal funds uh, for these essential services, and after we exhaust that topic, we'll be happy, I'll be happy to talk about other, other topics. Um, the uh, for years, I mean, I mean, I've been coming down here to the coast and talking about harbor maintenance. In the old days, I used to get our harbors dredged uh, with what are called earmarks. That is, I would go to the Appropriations Committee and I would get them to specify dredging at, in each of the harbors on the coast. And when Congress changed hands in 2010, uh, the Republicans prohibited earmarks. So I was no longer able to get specific funding to uh, dredge our ports. But being on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, uh, that uh, next year I was able to uh, change uh, what's called the Water Resources Development Act and set aside 10% uh, of the funds for what, what are called small and emerging ports. Uh, so we've been doing pretty well uh, on dredging since then, not as well as I would like, and, and we're only beginning really to deal with some of our jetty and uh, breakwater uh, problems. The, the interesting thing is a lot of things we're hung up on in Washington, D.C. in terms of infrastructure these days, like the major effort that I, we want to and I hope to do on service transportation, uh, and I'll go into that in a minute, but uh, is how are we going to pay for it? Uh, and uh, the nice thing, well, it's not nice, but the good thing uh, about harbor maintenance is we already have the money, we're just not spending it uh, on harbor maintenance. So way back in the Reagan era, before I was in Congress, uh, they recognized the need to have dedicated funds uh, as a maritime nation to maintain our harbors, uh, our ports, our jetties, breakwaters uh, around the country, but uh, needed and wanted to have a dedicated revenue source to do that. So they instituted a minuscule little tax on the value of imported goods coming into the country uh, through our ports. And that, uh, that tax generates somewhere uh, uh, north of uh, 1.8 to $2 billion a year. Uh, but for years, uh, Congress has been diverting the funds uh, and uh, putting them in an imaginary trust fund and not spending them. Uh, yet, if you look around the country, uh, the 58 largest ports in America are only uh, uh, basically on a daily basis uh, dredged to 40% of their authorized debts, which impedes commerce, creates longer lines of ships out in the ocean, et cetera. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in our smaller ports, we have, uh, you know, we have a failed, failed partially failed jetty, uh, North Jetty at Coos Bay, uh, which we have online, hopefully, to be, uh, begun work, I think, in 20 or 21, uh, to rebuild that. We're just working on the North Jetty at the Columbia River. Uh, we're, we're just now working on the breakwater at Port Orford, uh, and we have other needs up and down the coast and all around the country. So starting many, you know, Washington, D.C. doesn't make sense a lot of times, and, you know, I'd say to people, well, you know, I, you know, I, I want to spend the money from the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund on Harbor Maintenance, and everybody goes, yeah. Well, I said, well, it's not easy in Washington, D.C. So I started actually uh, with a guy named Bud Schuster, who was Republican chair of the Transportation, what was then called Public Works Committee, uh, back in 96 to try and create a real trust fund and spend harbor maintenance money only on harbor maintenance and not divert it elsewhere. Uh, it, I've been there long enough that his son, Bill Schuster, 
when the Republicans took over again, became the chair of the committee. So multi-generational. And, um, and then finally, uh, four years ago, um, to the surprise of the chairman, uh, he didn't think I could get the committee to agree to this, I got unanimous support on the committee, Republicans and Democrats, to dedicate the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund solely to Harbor Maintenance. And that was a big victory, except that the uh, uh, story doesn't quite end there, sorry, not a happy ending yet. Uh, when the bill moved to the floor, Speaker Paul Ryan had uh, took my, uh, my provision out of the bill uh, uh, because he didn't want to spend the money on harbor maintenance. Uh, and uh, so that, that was uh, four years ago, two years ago, same thing. I got it out of committee. Uh, it was the only thing removed from the bill going to the floor. Uh, let it, but, but yet they adopted a bunch of crazy amendments to fix local problems by changing national policy in other parts of the country uh, for Republican members of the committee. So, uh, but he's no Paul Ryan's history, uh, and I, I'm the chair of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and uh, I have moved the bill again unanimously, bipartisan, out of my committee, and I have a commitment from my leadership that the bill will come to the floor of the House uh, in September. And so we will finally direct the harbor maintenance funds to be spent on harbor maintenance. Senator Shelby uh, is uh, very, very anxious to, uh, to move this uh, in the Senate, and I'm very hopeful that he'll be able to do that. So, and in one of my meetings with President Trump, I brought up harbor maintenance, and he, and I mentioned this money sitting there, and he said, "Well, spend it, spend it." And I said, "Well, Mr. President, we're going to need your signature to do that." But that's what I intend to do. So. Uh, <laughs> So what it means is it'll take a lot of pressure off the core, and, and you'll hear a little bit uh, from the core uh, in a few minutes. But the core nationwide uh, is way underfunded. They have nearly a $40 billion backlog of critical infrastructure projects that aren't funded. Uh, this will give us, uh, over the next uh, decade, uh, this will mean uh, we're going to have about a $30 billion to spend on harbors which will relieve pressure elsewhere so they can begin to work inland and deal with some of their, I mean, we have an inland waterway system, needs maintenance, it's critical for moving, uh, you know, rain and everything out of the Midwest and, you know, down the, uh, the Mississippi, the Missouri River and all that, uh, but it'll relieve some of the pressure and they'll be able to get caught up elsewhere. So that's a start. So that's, that one's pretty good news, hopefully very good news soon. Uh, on uh, service transportation, we have uh, we, on the national highway system, uh, we have uh, 47,000 bridges that need repair or replacement, substantial repair or replacement. 40% of the national highway system is deteriorated to the point where you have to rebuild it from the, from the base up, not just resurface it. And in our urban areas uh, and major cities, uh, and even where we do provide some small amount of funds for rural transit, uh, we have a $100 billion backlog for state of good repair. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, we had a very optimistic meeting with the president in March, uh, and uh, he agreed to $2 trillion. Uh, his right wing, uh, you know, uh, chief of staff, uh, acting chief of staff, uh, Mick Mulvaney was out of town. Mick Mulvaney founded the Freedom Caucus in the House. He doesn't believe in government. He certainly doesn't believe in the government investing in transportation. So he came back to town and started a campaign to pull the president off the ledge from spending money on infrastructure and unfortunately succeeded, uh, at least temporarily, although the president indicated to Speaker Pelosi in a conversation that wasn't a very pleasant conversation because they were having a, quite a disagreement over uh, immigration policy, but he did express during that conversation he wanted to get back to infrastructure, we'll see uh, if he does. Uh, and I have, uh, I'm, I'm Begin, I've built, held hearings and beginning to move a, a six-year transportation bill to make those investments, but we need more funding. Uh, the, uh, the Senate uh, Majority Leader uh, or the, you know, has said that no, no gas tax, no diesel tax, and I don't know we'll ever pay for this. Uh, you know, I propose something that's pretty de minimis, uh, allow indexation of the gas and diesel tax cap it at one and a half cents a gallon a year. I say to my colleagues, raise your hand if you think if gas goes up one and a half cents a gallon, you're gonna lose your election. Because when you drove to work today, you went by and the digital sign probably went up or down three or five cents, depending <laughs> on what's going on in the world. Nobody's gonna notice. 
and we can bond $500 billion to put into the trust fund over the next 13 years. Um, so that's my solution, but I don't get to do that. I write the policy ways and means, has to figure out how to raise the money, but I've met regularly with Richie Neal from Massachusetts about this, and if the president will agree to some revenues, whether it's a very modest proposal like mine or the much bigger proposal he made for $2 trillion, uh, then, uh, then we'll be in good shape, but that's, that's uh, something to be seen uh, in the fall. Uh, now, uh, airports not tremendously relevant here. Uh, you get well, you got to go to California, or you got to go up to Coos Bay if you're nearest uh, commercial flight. Uh, we did get a little help uh, building a new terminal down uh, at uh, Crescent City uh, from the federal government, and um, I worked with a representative from that district on that. But all around the country, our airports are, are basically overburdened. Eugene needs to build a whole new uh, concourse, and uh, there's something called the passenger facility charge, a modest fee that you pay when you use the airport so that we don't charge everybody else who doesn't use the airport for the airport. When, and I started this program because I live in Springfield. Eugene built a new airport. The only way they could pay for it was uh, property tax. Uh, so. The people of Eugene are paying for the airport, and I'm using it more than 98% of the people, or 99% of the people in Eugene. I said, not fair. Uh, let's allow airports to assess a modest fee, do the bonding they need to do, and spread the costs over the users uh, of the airport. Uh, Congress hasn't allowed an increase in this fee since uh, the year 2000, uh, and the airlines say that if you were charged another $2 uh, to get through a more modern airport, more comfortably, more efficiently, through security and all that, you'll never fly again. But by the way, your bag charge is going up 10 bucks and you're going to thank us for it. So uh, I'm involved in a, a titanic struggle with the airlines over that. We'll see how that all works out. Um, just a couple more. Uh, clean water. Uh, we haven't reauthorized the federal program to partner with communities uh, for wastewater. Uh, since 1987, I'm uh, attempting to move that bill. I've almost got the Republicans to agree. We try and do things on a bipartisan basis in my committee, uh, and uh, we're very close to uh, an agreement on that. We're down to a couple of issues, and I want to authorize $30 billion to get back into partnership with communities like Port Orford lost uh, their outfall a number of years ago, and I have other communities uh, up at uh, uh, up in uh, Coos County, uh, further up that uh, have, uh, that are out of compliance in Inland, and Myrtle Creek and others where they have to rebuild their systems, they're under orders from state DEQ, yet the state doesn't have money to help them and the feds aren't there anymore, so I want to reinstate that program and help communities who are meeting federal and state mandates for what we all want, which is clean water. We don't want to be dumping stuff into our rivers like we used to do uh, back uh, in the 60s when rivers burned and the Willamette River was uh, an open sewer. So that's an important on that. And then finally, Coast Guard. Uh, we got a number of Coasties here. I want to thank them. I want to thank them for working without pay for 35 days. Uh, that should never happen again. And uh, I introduced a bill uh, in the House to say that, uh, you know, every other uniform military service was paid, uh, but they're in the DOD budget. Coast Guard is in the Homeland Security budget. Uh, we had passed the DOD appropriations. We had not passed Homeland Security. That was one of the items, well, that was the major item in contention because the President's stupid idea for a wall. And, uh, the, you know, the, the interesting fact that I uncovered as we got into that dispute is the Coast Guard intercepts more drugs than every other agency of the federal government combined. Uh, and that there are two preferred routes for bringing drugs into the United States by the cartels. And their growing favorite is maritime, but their other favorite is to drive trucks through our legal ports of entry, which they've modified. And it's a cost of doing business. They buy a semi, they put a fake floor in it, they fill it up with $50 million worth of drugs, and you know, they lose one truck, so what, 50 million bucks? We only inspect 6% of the trucks because we don't have the equipment, the personnel at the border to inspect them. They aren't backpacking, you know, billions of dollars worth of drugs into this country. A wall is going to do nothing to help. So if we got a few billion dollars to spend, let's spend it on the Coast Guard, let's spend it on real stuff at the border. So I got a provision... <laughs> I got a provision in the, in the bill as I passed out of committee, again unanimously, uh, that said we would pay the Coast Guard next time and if the government ever shuts down again. 
Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but there was some video about six weeks ago uh, of a coastie, uh, I think an ensign, jumping onto a submersible that's going through big swells out in the Pacific uh, from you know one of their zodiacs or whatever those those uh, boats are you use, and he's there pounded on the hatch and yelling and pounding on the hatch. Uh, and actually, uh, one of my staff was a former uh, Army guy. His son is one of the ensigns who was involved in that, a uh, brand new Coastie. Uh, so it's pretty close to home, and, and uh, you know they need more resources. They can only intercept. Admiral Sumikov, the last commandant, uh, said we can identify 80% of the maritime drug shipments, and we can intercept 20% of them because we don't have the resources, we don't have the staff. So if, again, if we want to stop that stuff, we need better resources. Unfortunately, by provision, uh, because of stupid budget rules we have in D.C., they said, well, you're, you know, you're, you're, you can't bring that to the floor because it violates the Budget Act because it costs an extra something billion dollars. I said, well, it doesn't cost anything extra. It just says we're going to pay the Coast Guard during the shutdown. They said, no, no. The way that the law works is the assumption is if we don't pay them, we will never pay them. So uh, I, I said, that's stupid. But anyway, uh, in order to move the bill, I took that out, but the Senate has included it in their version because they're not bound by the same stupid laws. Uh, our rules, so uh, hopefully uh, we'll come to an agreement uh, in September or October with the Senate and we will assure that uh, if we ever do this stupidity again of shutting down government that, that they will be paid. So that's uh, a few things I'm working on and then I just wanted to bring in some people who are actually doing the work uh, and can address a little bit more specifically uh, some of the issues here uh, on the coast. And uh, since uh, two of the projects we looked at today were uh, core, the one also involves limit, limiting the Coast Guard in terms of their capabilities here uh, on the lower road. Uh, so first I'll turn to uh, Colonel Dorf uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers out of Portland uh, for some brief remarks. And then after Colonel Dorf, uh, we will go to uh, Captain Olav Sabo from the uh, Coast Guard uh, Air Sector North Bend, talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing and uh, their needs and uh, what they're accomplishing. And then finally, ODOT, as we all know, we had a little bit of a problem on 101, and uh, I think he'll discuss a little bit about the resolution, or at least the sort of resolution of that problem, uh, and, and some other issues ODOT has. So uh, with that, Colonel. Congressman, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, our ODOT partners, and uh, also thank you for uh, being here, our, our Coast Guard partners. We work with quite a bit. So what I did is I decided they gave you a couple of minutes really just to kind of talk about the core and, and the district a little bit to kind of give you some context uh, on what we do. So I'm the commander of the Portland District. Uh, I'm one of 43 district commanders within the, the Corps of Engineers. There are a few OCONUS districts or outside the United States, but the majority are within the United States. Um, and really what we do for the nation um, is manage a number of different business lines and different authorized purposes, which I'm going to talk about. So I said, I'm one of the 43 district commanders. Most of what the Portland district, and that's our title, Portland district, does is work within the state of Oregon. We do have a little bit of territory in southwestern Washington, and that's primarily the ports around the Columbia River, and I'll talk to that a little bit. Um, we're one of five districts within the Northwestern Division, and again, we focus um, on Oregon and Washington, and our boundaries um, are really set based on civil works. Um, we call them civil works boundaries, and they're watershed based. So uh, we are kind of weird shapes, so we're not state boundaries, and there's different boundaries, but ours are based on watersheds. So the watersheds that the Portland District manages is we have the Lower Columbia, we have the Willamette, the Rogue River, and then we have the Oregon Coast. So again, uh, three, three watersheds uh, and the Oregon Coast is what kind of drives our, our boundary, and it looks like a big giant tooth that's sitting on top of Oregon. Uh, that's what we call it. So we have eight authorized purposes, and they're focused around the waters of the United States. So we do flood risk management, hydropower, water management, regulatory, recreation, navigation, environmental stewardship, and emergency management. So those are the authorized purposes that Congress has authorized the Corps to do. Um, and you also wonder, is why is an Army guy doing this? Well, this dates all the way back to the founding of our country. The Army moved westward. The Corps picked up this mission, has retained the Civil Works mission ever since. 
So we, as part of the district, we operate three locks and dams on the Columbia River, so the three big plants in the lower Columbia. We also operate 13 dams within the Willamette Valley and two within the Rogue River Valley. So if you go upriver here, we have Lost Creek Lake, Lost Creek Dam, that's one of our projects. And we also manage Applegate um, a little bit further south along the Oregon-California border. Um, and that's part of our project as well. Um, 12 hydropower dam, or there's 12 hydropower plants associated with those dams, and we have three of the five largest hydropower producing dams uh, within the country who generate about six gigawatts of power. So if you add the three in the Columbia and the ones in the Willamette and Lost Creek, it's just, just shy of six gigawatts of power is our generating capacity. Uh, we also have regulatory authority, uh, for the, and so the regulatory boundary is by state. So we have the state of Oregon, and then we regulate the ports in southwestern Washington uh, because they're associated with the Columbia River. Um, and we also have the, the seven uh, state ports in Washington. We also manage the Section 404, which is the Clean Water Act, which a lot of folks are familiar with, which is the discharge of fill into waters of the United States, and Section 10, which is fill into navigable waters um, and dealing with dredge fill. So we manage those two things as part of the regulatory mission. Uh, we also have 22 navigation channels and 12 large-scale jetty product projects. And we just came from Port Orford where we're doing um, storm supplemental work and we're actually moving large stones up to 32 tons as we rebuild and do the repairs on the Port Orford breakwater. Uh, Portland District also manages 485 miles of navigable rivers um, in Oregon and in the Columbia Basin and, 200, and there's 224 uh, miles of managed waterways. Uh, the core navigation mission really is to provide safe, reliable, efficient, environmentally friendly, sustainable waterborne transportation systems, something the Congress was just talking about, which includes channels, harbors, and waterways uh, for the movement of commerce and national security and recreation. So recreation is an important part of our mission. Uh, navigation structures are used for the passage um, and they come in a number of different things. So there's navigation channels, jetties, breakwaters, groins, and there's pile dikes. So you'll see those timber piles that stick out in the river to help train the river to give a more reliable channel. And we manage those as well. Um, and how we do that is through a number of different types of assets. So we do uh, a number of different types of dredging. Um, so we use, we own and operate two large dredges. We have the Essayons, which is a 350 foot hopper dredge. We have the Aquina, which I just visited yesterday, which is the Aquina Bay at a Newport working the channel there, uh, which is a 200 foot hopper dredge. So that gives us about 6,500 uh, cubic yards worth of capacity organic to the core. And then we have a number of contracts. We have a hopper contract, which gives us uh, one additional large hopper, and we have the Port of Portland, the Dredge Oregon, which works in the Columbia River. We also have a whole slew of different clamshell uh, contracts as well that are working all over the Columbia River and up and down the coast. So we manage this hopper contract and have a variety of different assets, and I think there's seven different contracts that manage all the different dredging for the 2019 dredging season. We also manage dredging all the way down to the Port of Moro, which is the Los Angeles district in Southern California and up to Grays Harbor in Seattle. And we do dredging out to ha Hawaii as well. So that's kind of our AOR for dredging. And we try to synchronize to get the best dollar value out of the federal and the non-federal assets. Um, so bringing it home a little bit. So between the Rogue River and the Gold Beach specific, the Corps has two functions here. We do dredging and jetty maintenance. So this year, the Aquina removed 43,000 cubic yards from the entrance in June and July, uh, which was successful. And we also dredged the boat basin. Um, so we just came from the boat trip looking at the boat basin. In 2018, we had a, a fairly large amount of fill. Um, it was cobbles, vice the typical sand we had seen before. And we were able to work with the Coast Guard and the port to be able to do that. And then this year, uh, we were able to get a urgent compelling because it filled in again and it shoaled. And when that was awarded in June, we were able to do uh, critical work and move 1,500 uh, cubic yards of cobble that had fall, uh, it kind of accreted inside the main channel. So those are the works we're doing here. And the good news is the president, president's budget has requested 942,000 uh, to dredge the entrance bar for next year for FY20. So uh, we continue to monitor it um, and we'll continue to work those specific issues in, in uh, and Gold Beach and uh, the Rogue River here, as well as Maine up, uh, upstream, the Lost Creek Reservoir Lake and Powerhouse. Uh, I do have some experts here with me. If there's questions afterwards, I can try to help if there's anything specific. With that, I'll pass off to Captain Siegel. Thank you, Colonel. And thank you, Congressman DeFazio, for inviting the Coast Guard to participate today in today's town hall. So as you heard, uh, my name is Captain Olaf Sabo, and I'm the sector commander 
of Sector North Bend. We are located at the airport up in North Bend, and we are one of 36 sectors across the entire Coast Guard. So our area of responsibility goes from the California-Oregon border, about 220 miles north, to the town of Lincoln City. And in, in that area, your Coast Guard, we've got six small boat stations, uh, which I've got one of them right here from our station down in Brookings or Checo River, and that's Mass Chief Dave Pierres. Um, and he's got, uh, or we've got five other additional surf stations just like we do in Checo. Uh, we also run all the air uh, side from the airport up there in North Bend, as well as an air facility up in the town of Newport. So that's five helicopters that are patrolling this area and about 36 boats that are patrolling the area as well as the Cutter Orcas, which is home ported up in, uh, in Coos Bay and has responsibility for this and that 220 miles of coastline as well. So what does your uh, Coast Guard bring to your communities? Well, uh, what I oversee is about 500 active duty, reserve, and civilian employees between those that 220 miles of coastline. And what they bring to your communities is another 750 thereabouts between uh, dependents or family members. So that's uh, spouses and children. Uh, when you add that up, that's 1,250 Coast Guard related folks that are serving somewhere along this southern and central Oregon coast. And we're pretty proud of being here and patrolling the area and taking care of the maritime public. So in this area, uh, primarily we're looking out for our biggest customers, if you will, are the commercial fishermen. Right behind that is the recreational fishermen. In fact, today, right down in your port of, of Gold Beach, there's about 60 boats is what Mass Chief uh, counted, I think. Um, and that's a lot of folks that are coming over to use the Port of Gold Beach and go out there and, and salmon fish. And again, that's who we're looking out for um, as in addition to the high seas where we've got both recreational and commercial fishermen as well. And then all the tourists that are using these fabulous Oregon beaches, especially on a beautiful day like this. So um, that, that's what the Coast Guard is doing up and down this coast, this 220 miles of uh, coastline. And what I just wanted to emphasize is uh, right here in Gold Beach, you've got a SAR detachment. So what we do is kind of monitor when those salmon runs start coming in and people start coming over from the valley, uh, from, you know, from down California, from Washington, and they're looking to go and fish here and use the, use the beaches, is we'll open up that SAR detachment. And that's coming from uh, our station down in Checo River. And we'll man a boat, you've probably seen it out there, uh, as Coasties, we like to be part of the community and hopefully, you know, you, you, you see us uh, Coasties operating in the area. And unfortunately, this summer, because of the shoaling that occurred uh, this past winter uh, and, and is blocking part of that channel, we're not able to bring the asset that we'd like to, our 47-foot motor lifeboat, which is our preferred asset to have. So we've got a, a little bit less capability this summer just because we're not able to operate uh, our our larger vessel because of that shoaling and because of some of the shallow water. So we do have a presence here. It's not necessarily what we prefer to have, um, and that's fine for a day like today, but when, that, when the seas start building and the weather is a little bigger and that, that bar is breaking, that poses some problems for us because um, I'm not gonna let Mass Chief Pierre send a crew out over a breaking bar in that 29-foot boat that we have here. And so we do everything we can to try to prevent the recreational fishermen that are out there right now from going out over there and putting themselves in harm's way because we're not going to do any, be able to do what we'd like to. And that's uh, because of that, uh, that needed dredging that uh, we continue to support and are excited to hear that uh, next summer it is going to, you know, looks like there, there's momentum to make that happen because, again, we'd like to have our motor lifeboat up here for you all and for that maritime public that's using this great port of of Gold Beach. Um, and again, uh, got a couple of other Coast Guard experts here today, so if there's any questions specifically for the Coast Guard, uh, feel free to ask any of us or afterwards we're happy to chat a little bit offline if uh, there's any other questions you may or may not have. And uh, that, that's the other point. Uh, in addition to the dredging and working with the, the Corps of Engineers and um, on the federal side to make sure that we're able to operate the way we prefer to, 
Uh, it's also investing, as you heard the congressman say, into our infrastructure. We definitely see that in our units up and down this coast. That uh, you know, we've got aging infrastructure uh, just down in in Checo River at the station. There, we've got a you know water mains that are coming into the spit there that need to be replaced. Uh, have been needing to for for a long time now, and we're you know appreciate uh, that support to try to. Uh, bring those to the higher level so that we can, you know, take care of that aging infrastructure. I, I mentioned that also emergency generator that uh, you know doesn't necessarily operate 24/7 the way we need it to in case the, the electric grid goes out uh, in a storm or whatnot, so that we can continue to provide that Coast Guard pre presence for the maritime public up and down this coast. I thank you for your time, and I think I'll turn it over to uh, Frank with the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Congressman. My name is Frank Reading. I'm the Southwest Region Manager for the Department of Transportation. Um, I guess just a little bit of uh, information about the agency. Uh, for Region 3, um, we've got about 350 employees, and we oversee the operation, the development, and maintenance of projects throughout the five Southwest counties. That's Coos, Curry, Douglas, Jackson, and Josephine. So we've got a lot going on. I can see a number of you have the handout that I brought in. I placed those and made those available on your seat. And I also have extra copies on the back table if you want it. That's basically a takeaway for you. So you can actually see the volume of work that's happening in the South Coast area. I thought that'd be really great for you to have. What I wanted to do was take just a few minutes to touch lightly on some of those projects that are in the vicinity of Gold Beach. Um, and just focus on maybe a little bit of conversation around the who's going to slide that Congress mentioned uh, earlier. So recent projects that we've completed um, are Thomas Creek Bridge and Rye <laughs> You know, I know it's a challenge. You know, I know it's a challenge, but it's really critically important to make sure that we're keeping those bridges up to stuff if we can. You know, doing the uh, coating on those bridges, protecting them from the harsh coastal environment, really important because the cost to replace is astronomical. So thanks for your patience through that. Um, <laughs> North of Port Orford, we've also just completed about five miles of paving and about four, I think we worked on four different bridges rehabilitating those to the tune of about uh, 6.5 million, I think it was for those. And actually the Reinhardt Creek and Thomas Creek were about $14 million of federal investment. A lot of money. A um, couple other projects, handful of other projects um, that are a little bit different in nature are those that are funded with federal emergency funds. Who's Canadian Slide? Arizona Inn. The slide we have at 332 that we're working on right now. And even the slide on Highway 42, which is a critical route between the inland and coast, we've been working on all those with federal dollars. We could not do those type of projects if that money was not made available to us. And the partnership we have with the federal government and making sure they can make that money available to us is essential to that, our transportation system surviving. Total dollars expended by the time we through all those is about $14 million when you add it all up. That's including costs to just initially get the roads opened up. That's a lot of money. Thinking about projects in the future, um, well, I'll talk a little bit more about who's today since, since I'm touching on it here. Project closed the road for approximately 13 days. We were fortunate to be able to open up a detour on Carpenterville Road. It wasn't the best thing. It's a difficult road, 17 miles, very difficult. We were lucky to have it there. Um, we've got the road back in two-lane configuration now and we actually are negotiating with a contractor to put it back in its three-lane configuration as we speak, pretty much. We want to try to get that done. We were hoping to get that done this year, but it looks like we're going to move into next season with getting that work completed. That, again, is being completed with emergency relief funds. Long term, you know, we've looked at solutions out there, and the price tag is astronomical. From full span bridges, total rebuild of Carpenterville Road, we're in the hundreds of millions of dollars very difficult to think about that kind of level of funding coming to us. So what I've done is I've asked my staff to program a project in our state transportation improvement program to look at some form of a feasibility study to see if we can analyze from Port Orford South. Because it's more than just that slide. If Arizona goes out, there's no detour. What can we do to be better prepared to help either find lower cost alternatives or be able to maybe potentially have a shorter detour route for some of these type of facility, some type of these areas. So we're going to look into that. That's going to take some time. In the short term, we'll also work with some of the local uh, 
folks that were really impacted by those slide closures to see if there's something else we could do with the detour to make it more useful. Uh, so that's really very high level. A couple of the products that are coming at us in the future, we're going to be back in Port Orford, we're going to be downtown, we're going to be doing pedestrian improvements and uh, ramp improvements, things of that nature. We're going to be paving through town there as well. We're also going to be working on another critical east-west route, and that's over on Highway 38 with a Scottsburg bridge replacement. Those of you may have seen that bridge hit in the past, where it almost causes it to fall down. Well, we'll have a brand new bridge there, and that's a combination of state and federal funds, about $42 million. So there's a lot of money flowing into the region here. Uh, I guess in closing, I would just share that the region and Oregon are extremely reliant on federal funds to both maintain and enhance our transportation system. We also recognize the value of having chairman from Oregon sitting there, the House Transportation Committee, helping to send that message. <laughs> Transportation funding. Can't speak enough about it. So with that, I'll hand it off to Congressman. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I joke and say I was an apprentice for 32 years, and I finally got uh, to hold the gavel. So uh, it's it's uh, been a long learning, and I'm always learning. Uh, just uh, today, talking to them and looking at the alternatives for the slide was an interesting brief I got back in I don't know, March or something like that and uh, you know for a lot of these places there aren't uh, right now any really good known alternatives uh, I've done some unique things in the past Mike Thompson used to have the, the district up to the California border uh, and uh, back during the transportation bill 2006 we have what were called earmarks uh, which I intend to bring back, which is congressionally designated high priority spending. I don't believe that all the wisdom resides in the Secretary of Transportation, Washington, D.C., or the uh, or the Oregon legislature, because sometimes they tend to ignore areas uh, of the state. And, uh, you know, but uh, anyway, we put some money into the road, the California road, which goes into Oregon, which goes, which is another alternative, our southern alternative, essentially, to access this area back uh, during that bill to make that road more robust, uh, but, but more needs to be done. So anyway, uh, with that, uh, be happy to take questions. We'll start with questions relating to any of the issues that have been raised so far, and if we run out of people who have questions regarding that, then we'll move on to other subjects. So with that, uh, the staff has a microphone, and they just look for someone to raise their hand and hand it out. There's someone over there, Chris, over there. there. Oh, okay. Wait. Oh, we have two people hanging out there. Okay. Good afternoon, Congressman. I, I don't. Yeah. Oh, no, it came on. That's just a little. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for the work you do. Um, you've mentioned a couple times about everybody's talked about the dredging out here in the road and the shoveling on the road. Um, besides the mouth of the port over there, are you are you planning on doing other dredging further up river, um, basically across from the uh, old river view and between there and Tidewater property? Well, the, um, the, that would be uh, up to, uh, unfortunately, that's up to the state, not the feds. The feds only do uh, federally designated uh, navigation channels, and actually that just basic, that ends below the bridge. So uh, there, and, you know, right now there's no, uh, there's no federal program to do uh, work upstream. Uh, you know, when Bill gave us a tour, uh, you know, we talked about the migration of gravel. He showed me photos from the, I don't know, start, Bill said he was going to be here. I don't know if he's here. Oh, so there, right there. Starting in the 40s of the movement and the forming and reforming and the movement of the gravel. Of course, they moved the entrance to the harbor because that kept shoaling in. This has worked for 20 years. We're going to get it opened up again next year, but there, you know, anything uh, upstream from there. My understanding is that there's discussions between the port and the state and some gravel companies about getting the state uh, to permit uh, removal of gravel upstream uh, and sell it at a very, very low price uh, to the gravel companies and to give them permission to go up and essentially mine some of that gravel, which would be one way of getting rid of it and also putting it to good use. I've been involved in issues further upstream on the river uh, you know, we used to have a number of people doing dry bar scalping, which I thought was a great way to get good quality aggregate without causing any environmental issues. 
um, but a number of years ago, uh, concerns were raised. We had 11 people who had permits, and they said, well, wait a minute, what's the aggregate impact? And, and state DSL and the federal uh, National Marine Fisheries, and I said, well, we're not sure about this. I mean, I had this one, you know, kept fighting on this issue to try and get them back to dry bar scalping, which I don't think would solve the problem, but might mitigate it a little bit. And um, I, at one point, I had to borrow the judges' conference chambers in the courthouse because I have a very small office. I had 12 people and agencies represented there, and then we also had a big phone tree of people. And we made a little progress, but uh, this next attempt will be at the state level and I'll certainly help uh, facilitate to whatever extent I can dealing with the state on the issue. So, Thank you. other anything else anybody wants to raise? So, yes, sure. Bill. Well, as you know, here, here you take the mic. I know you've got the uh, Bill Milton there. I'm the president of the Port of Gold Beach, and I've been at about 12 of your town hall meetings now, and we talk about earmarks. And obviously you and I are well versed on the dredging, but I want to re in, uh, restate that the high dock project I keep reminding you of is, a, is the second priority project at Port of Gold Beach. And we put aside the reserve money for the match because it's about a $2.2 million project. And I, I told you before, uh, but when earmarks went out of style, that uh, that was a shovel ready project. The engineering is done. It's ready to be permitted. We figured it was about a $2.0 million project to replace that high dock the sheet pile high dock right like more now it is what that was what it was about a number of years ago right. but we yeah. still have the engineering shovel ready we have the matching funds in the port which we figure might be three to four hundred thousand dollars we've got that we can write a check so i just want to keep that on the table as our second most important project after dredging now bill i'm with you on that you know we've talked about many times and uh you know, I intend to bring back uh, congressionally designated high priority projects. No longer will we have earmarks because they get a bad name, but uh, I'll defend anyone I ever got and I've brought back uh, hundreds of millions, well, I think over a billion dollars in designated spending or earmarks over my career in New Oregon. And, uh, but um, the Senate has not yet agreed, but here's the interesting thing about the Senate. Even before they banned earmarks, the Senate would always say, when we're doing a major service transportation bill, we don't, you know, we don't want earmarks. And then we pass a bill in the House, we would actually legislate the earmarks, meaning they went through public review, they went through a hearing, they had to be done in the light of day, and that prevented scandals. But then the Senate would come in at the, afterwards and say, oh, we're going to conference on the transportation bill, Where's our money? I said, what do you mean your money? He said, you didn't, you didn't want earmarks. Oh, no, no, we want, you got, you got 30 billion, we want 30 billion. So uh, the Senate didn't do it quite as transparently, and thus far they're saying they're not gonna re reinstate them, but we'll see. If we start moving them out of the House, uh, I think the Senate will be uh, come to the table, but I'm not gonna prove anything that hasn't gone through a public process. Uh, and that's how we got into trouble before. Some of these things were what they call eardropped. We wrote a bill, the Senate wrote a bill, nobody knew what these were, and some staff person, because uh, the Senate is run by staff, uh, drop, would drop it into the bill, and then, oh, wait a minute, what was that? It benefited a private development? That was it. So anyway, we're not going back to those bad old days. I've already reformed, proposed reforms to the process. So. Uh, anything else anyone wants to bring up? Otherwise, we'll move on to, yes, right there, gentlemen, uh, use the mic. Hi, my name's Dave, I live in Gold Beach, thank you. Um, I really appreciate all your efforts to work on our infrastructure, and I think that's really important. And our rivers are also a part of our infrastructure, so thank you again for all your efforts to protect our wild and scenic rivers from various yeah. I just wanted to make one suggestion. Um, with all this jetty improvement, our dredging, and everything, that's really important, but we've been without the Port Orford buoy for a couple years now. And I believe we have retrieved it, but it's still not 15 miles offshore where it's supposed to be. So I'm just hoping that we can get that back in place for our commercial fishermen and our other ocean users that rely on that data that we get from those buoys. Okay, I don't know whether that's uh, something you're saying. Start it's gonna... a NOAA buoy? Yeah. Oh, it's a NOAA buoy. Okay, all right, we're gonna pass the buck. That's NOAA. <laughs> <laughs> Good pass, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, those are critical buoys. I mean, knowing wave heights, wind direction, uh, all that stuff is really critical. 
Noah is sorely, I mean, even having I mean, we talked about problems with the Coast Guard, he talked about, I can't remember, they've given me numbers on their capital backlog for the Coast Guard. Two in addition to the, hmm? Two billion. Two billion. In addition to, two billion, not, you know, B. Uh, and in addition to the additional allocations, we finally got in the bill I passed out of the House for uh, the new offshore patrol cutters. Finally, icebreakers were virtually at the point of not having an icebreaker. Uh, I've been on uh, the icebreaker. You know, they have to, it has transistors, but, you know, they don't make any more. And, you know, I mean, it's really, we've been salvaging things off the, the other one, which we were scrapping uh, to uh, keep it running. So we're finally getting it. But uh, they do have, but Noah's even in worse shape, uh, and uh, that's that's an ongoing problem. But those are those are critical. That is critical. So. Well, I'm a transplant from Sisters. I want to thank you for all the things you did for us, and I want to know: Do you still have your old car? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I got to, I was driving home from the airport late one night, and the uh, the dark they had a, like the they have ammeters. It was the first. I mean, it was modern at the time. You know, slant six with an alternator as opposed to generator, and the needle disc was like, and then my lights get dim, and I'm like, oh. you know. Anyway, I decided that uh, having to buy parts on eBay and out of junkyards, and uh, having a car that wasn't totally reliable was getting a little old. So. Uh, the guy offered me way more money than I thought it was worth because he collected them. So it now has gone to Southern California and it's part of a small, this guy has like 10 Dodge Darts. So he has <laughs> my Dodge Dart and I bought a uh, mo much more modern fuel efficient car. So. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Dean Finnerty and I just wanted to yeah. Hey, so. let you know it's how much funny. we appreciate how grateful we are for the work that you do in a thankless job, in a thankless place, and for you to go back and to fight the good fight for us like you do. And I also wanted to thank you for your leadership for protecting areas that are so hugely important to our recreational economy here on the South Coast, our salmon and steelhead runs, and I just think you're doing a great job, and I want to thank you for that. In the, uh, in the package we passed, which included some wilderness areas and other protections, national bill uh, that we got early this year, uh, we of course did have the, the Frank, and Jeannie, Frank and Jeannie Moore uh, steel, steel, uh, Salmon and Steelhead Sanctuary or whatever, we, I can't remember what we finally Yeah, Frank and Jeannie Moore Wild Steelhead Special Management Area. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and had a couple of different names. Uh, which is, uh, which is uh, an absolutely critical area. Uh, up on the Unclaw River. Uh, we also uh, preempted some additional uh, potential for mining claims and strip mining down here. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's an ongoing battle. You know, I've been fighting this battle. I think it's the third company that's proposed uh, to do nickel mining, all foreign. Uh, and at this point, it, I mean, when it was first proposed, I think it was a real threat because we, we had the nickel mill in hand and uh, at Riddle, and that's long gone, dismantled. There is no domestic processor of nickel ore. Uh, and I think at this point, they're just trying to blackmail us uh, because I, you know, and I, I challenge them, try and prove for the claims they have, which I can't undo, uh, try and prove it out economically that you're gonna mine low grade nickel ore, destroying precious natural resources, and you're gonna truck it to where and ship it to China or Australia, and this is a viable project, it's not a viable project. And we've seen this before where people state claims uh, and then want the government to buy them out. Uh, the one I was involved in was regarding the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area. Some people had a big in holding and they said they were gonna mine it. Uh, and this normally would be exempt because it wasn't a precious mineral, but they were gonna mine it for sand which some dead BLM geologists had said was unique and so they had a somewhat viable claim and um, we fought that uh, to a, a standstill over a number of years and but it was pretty funny because then and I, I got that stopped and then suddenly there were a whole bunch of new claims further down near Coos Bay 
I'm like, well, who's filing these claims? It was two guys who'd been in prison in Idaho and were reading the papers and they read about <laughs> this and they thought, what a great scam. So uh, they then tried, I mean, we have to reform the mining laws in this country. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking, we're talking. Things were a little different in 1872. And that's, uh, that's what our mining laws are derived from, is an 1872 act, which is it's this vast wilderness out there. We have to incentivize people to go and uh, develop it and, and uh, mine it and, uh, and that. So uh, we have passed mining reform twice in the House. Uh, and uh, I, before I left the Resources Committee, I wrote uh, another reform. The Republicans wouldn't consider it. Uh, Raul Grijalva chairs that, sub, that committee now has introduced the bill that I wrote a number of years ago, and I'm hopeful that we will move it, although the Senate will again be tough. But, uh, you know, I think it's just long overdue that we reform that act, so. Yeah, again, ditto, uh, Dean, on thank you for your work to protect our rivers, Congressman. That, that's really important, and uh, we all know that nobody's been a better advocate for transportation here. You've also supported action to uh, address the issues of climate change, which are very important to us with rising sea level, intensified droughts, and wildfire. How, what opportunities do you see to address those issues through the transportation programs and the, uh, the funding that is available there? Sure. Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, well, I've tasked, I held the first ever hearing of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee on climate change issues uh, early this year. Well, I convened the hearing, except I wasn't there. I got stuck at my house in that snowstorm. We had 30 inches at my house, and I couldn't, it was two days before I could post hole down the hill to have someone pick me up at the bottom. And we had five trees fall in the house, so it was a little bit hectic time. So um, anyway, uh, what we had the hearing, and um, I've tasked every one of my subcommittees, uh, and every subcommittee does have relevance to uh, climate change. Uh, obviously the biggest one, the largest single contributor to carbon pollution in the United States is transportation. Uh, so uh, we're approaching that in a number of different ways. One is uh, we, need to, uh, electri we need to have electrified routes uh, for transportation infrastructure. I, I took the committee to Europe. I mean we actually saw in Sweden uh, a highway that charges trucks as they drive. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's like incredible innovations that are coming uh, in electrification. I, I, I had a, a seminar, well, a session at my Eugene Water Electric Board who has surplus uh, renewable power and they're going to uh, crack water with surplus power, create hydrogen, hydrogen, and they're going to then market the hydrogen to the local transportation district who will run buses with hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells. So I want to set national policy to promote uh, things like that, hydrogen electrification. Uh, we also have to build out, uh, you know, we've got to rebuild a lot of our infrastructure and we need to rebuild it in a way that's more resilient given climate change and the resilience that we're most concerned about here is earthquake uh, and we have to build, rebuild for earthquake resilience. Uh, so surface will be a big part of it. Uh, I'm also uh, working on promoting more uh, maritime transportation. Uh, because the most efficient way to move goods is on water. Uh, and, uh, you know, we aren't utilizing our, you know, what we, I want to uh, pick up on what's called short sea shipping. It's hard to say. Short sea shipping, I got it out. And uh, so I'm going to try and uh, incentivize that in working through uh, issues uh, with, uh, you know, with the maritime uh, uh, jurisdiction I have in my committee. Uh, for wastewater, uh, I want to have uh, uh, sewer and metropolitan wastewater districts uh, capture their methane. It's not a huge methane contributor, but methane's really bad. And uh, we had testimony from uh, uh, a, a consortium in New Jersey that was doing this. They captured their methane and they produce enough electricity to run the plant. They sell power onto the grid and they rebuilt the system and they didn't have to raise rates. Uh, so I want to make that eligible for federal reimbursement and, and uh, out of what I'm doing uh, with wastewater. Uh, one of the tougher things is going to be aviation. Uh, and, but I had a great meeting today with, I can't remember the name of the group, it's a consortium. There's four, 400 businesses in Oregon that do something in the area of aviation. And uh, 
they are looking at trying to uh, facilitate sort of a shared ride service with Part 135 carriers uh, for smaller communities to get air service, and the state has given them some money to do that. And they're envisioning in the future this is going to be done, and these things are only two or three years out now with electric uh, uh, transport that will have range of, of two to 400 miles. Uh, so we'll be able to fly people in these, that it only be six or eight passenger, but they're actually prototypes that are now being certified to do this. So uh, bigger aircraft are gonna be a tougher problem. Biofuels are probably a, more of a solution there, but also Boeing and Airbus are working on hybrids, so we need to encourage that, but how, how that's gonna work out, we're not sure. So I think every aspect uh, you know, of my committee, I'm probably leaving out something, well, I've got rail. Uh, also, and um, you know, I want to encourage. Uh, I just had a rail meeting in Eugene yesterday to talk about the fact that it takes three and a half hours if you're lucky to get from Eugene to Portland on the train, and uh, you know, we've got to solve that problem. And I said, if you could do it in just two and a half hours, which is still pretty slow, uh, I would never drive I 5 again because yeah. if I'm lucky, I can do it an hour 50, and if I'm not lucky, who knows how long it's going to take because of the backups and accidents. Uh, and so uh, I got the first uh, Al Swift guy who's long retired, and I got uh, Eugene to Vancouver, BC, designated as one of the first high-speed rail corridors in the United States, but we've never, never taken advantage of it. So, uh, you know, I, at the moment I'm not looking to high speed, 200 miles an hour, but if we can get higher speed, the train sets we have can go 120 miles an hour. I'd imagine that if I could get, get to Portland in 75 minutes, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we, we're going to, uh, you know, I'm going to be encouraging that through reauthorizing Amtrak, uh, uh, which is another task my committee has. So all aspects of, of my committee are, are uh, working on our contribution uh, toward uh, climate change, reducing the carbon footprint. So. Okay. I did today, and it, it's a, a, a bit distant from here, but it, it, it's going to impact us. Uh, I got really pretty, well, let's use a play word, upset uh, this uh, over the last few days about what Bolsonaro is doing uh, in Brazil. And, uh, you know, he thinks he can act with impunity. And the fact is that they are a huge exporter to the United States of beef, soy, soy oil. Uh, used for biodiesel and other things, and uh, uh, and other products that they are producing off deforested land. So I'm introducing a bill I announced today that will prohibit the importation of any goods uh, from Brazil that are being produced on deforested land until he stops it. <laughs> As a legislature, is there anything you can do to stop the Jordan Cove project? We've had this conversation many times, uh, and unfortunately it's a long uh, history. The Bush-Cheney Energy Act of uh, 19, uh, 2006, which I opposed, preempted state and local control of energy projects. We used to have something called the Energy Facility Siting Council in Oregon. Uh, under Oregon land use law, and uh, that gave the counties and the state a role in the siting of any major energy project and or pipeline and or high tension line. Uh, and uh, the uh, legislation passed uh, and preempted state and local control. Uh, and uh, it gave the, the authority to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is accountable only to the president, under existing law. They're appointed by the president, they're independent agency, they report to the president. Uh, the authority to give eminent domain to private entities, which I think is unconstitutional, but unfortunately there was a court case uh, in Connecticut uh, which uh, where the court found, in fact, that um, there could be a public purpose in a private uh, eminent domain action by government uh, to benefit private development. And uh, so uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has that authority and I've introduced legislation I, I posted at the time, I tried to mention I had a bill at the time, worked with Ed Markey. Uh, I've introduced the bill before, but maybe I'll have more luck now with Democrats in charge to say that you cannot designate 
uh, eminent domain to private entities uh, for uh, these sorts of projects. Uh, and that would bring the whole thing to a halt. But I mean, this really should be back under the old system. And I made fun of the Republicans at the time because I said, look, you're the private property rights and states' rights people, and you are preempting private property rights and states' rights through this bill. I mean, how can you, you know, they had no shame. They blew us off and they did it. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, so, uh, you know, I tried to, the first, you know, I mean, the pipeline has been obviously pricing an awful lot of federal land and, and private land, and I even tried to get the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to choose a different route for the public lands. I mean, I think at least, you know, like we could take care of, and it was less sensitive and would have affected ultimately less private property, but also less sensitive federal property, and they just blew it off. They don't care. They don't care what I think, so. Congressman, it's truly an honor to have you here in Gold Beach tonight. And it's a rare thing where we can have a um, representative that we believe in. Um, very important to us. I have a friend, Frank Prince, that lives in our local assisted living facility. He couldn't be here. He wanted to be here tonight. But I swore that I would ask his question instead of my question. Okay. And he has a theory that Donald Trump has been um, laundering money for the Russian mafia for decades. And he feels like uh, this is why we're in the position that we're in with, in regards with his uh, relationship with Russia. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as you know, we, we have numerous uh, inquiries going on. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee has asked for his tax returns, which would reveal the sources of his funding. It's unusual. Uh, that the king of debt suddenly started buying a whole lot of properties for cash. There is a quote from one of his sons about seven or eight years ago saying, you know, oh, we're dealing with these guys in Russia and you don't want to mess with them. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Deutsche Bank was in court in New York today under uh, order of the judge to uh, state whether or not they had the Trump, uh, Trump's taxes and whether or not uh, they would turn them over to the state of New York. Uh, and so, and uh, you know, we have subpoenaed uh, uh, reams of documents from my, my committee doesn't have a lot of jurisdiction. I do have jurisdiction over the Trump Hotel because that's a federal, uh, a federal facility, uh, the old post office, and it's under lease, and the lease says no elected official of the United States shall benefit from this lease. Uh, and uh, we, when before the election, just after the election, my staff met with the head of the, the uh, uh, GSA who administers the lease and the guy said, yeah, no, this is a problem. We don't know how we're going to deal with this. And uh, lo and behold, on the, the first day of Trump's presidency, that guy was uh, seconded to uh, the District of Columbia to work with them on some other issue. Uh, and they brought in a woman uh, who said there was no problem and we had her in a hearing and I said, could I see the legal opinion. She said, well, there's no legal opinion. I said, well, you must have some phone records or something, and no. Uh, so that was when we were in the minority. I'm now in the majority. I have asked formally uh, for uh, those records. Uh, they have not been forthcoming, so I'm going to be issuing a subpoena, but right now they're fighting every subpoena in court, and it's an unprecedented stonewalling by any president. We've had presidents who stonewall, but he makes Richard Nixon look like a piker. And, uh, you know, the, uh, but, but the fact is that it's, oversight is not in the Constitution, but it is a long accepted and legitimate function of the legislative branch. But they are consistently going to court and saying what, there is no legislative purpose. Getting his taxes, no legislative purpose. Getting his hotel records, no legislative purpose. Uh, determining whether or not he's viable, which is also part of my investigation, the emoluments clause said any profits that would come from foreign nationals, uh, you know, in, in his hotels, he would, turn, he would turn the money over, but we can't get any records of that, and the Saudis rent out whole floors and send one sheet to live on three floors of a hotel for weeks at a time just for fun. Uh, so, um, you know, this is uh, very serious stuff, and so I, I had some hope that Robert Mueller would be more forthcoming in his testimony, he wasn't. And so uh, I had told the chairman of the committee months ago, because we'd had a conversation, he said, you know, if we, if we file 
uh, for an, a formal impeachment inquiry, then we have a very clear constitutional purpose, not just a legislative purpose. And the courts, some scholars say, will give us more deference and they might honor the subpoenas more quickly without going through two and three years of trial. So I came out publicly after Mueller and said, I, I want to see the formal impeachment inquiry, uh, and hopefully it'll give us a to, to, do, to do what we need to do as a legislative branch. So uh, that's you know the current state of affairs there, but how that'll unfold and what really happened, how it happened, who's been involved. But Deutsche Bank was known for laundering money for the, the Russian oligarchs. And, uh, so, and what, all this money comes from, all this big loans came from Deutsche Bank. So what's the nexus? We, don't, we just don't know. Yep, I, know, I see that, Dan, but we're getting, Chris, uh, one or two more, and then we can get going. Right over there, there's a gentleman away on your left, I guess, your left, my right. Uh, John Morton, I'll change the topic just a little bit. Uh, you've been such a benefit in your political career to not only your district, but uh, in many other areas. What's your crystal ball for your future? <laughs> well, and how will your legacy be passed on? Well, it's a good, good question. Sure, there. yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can brush on it. I can't get into that. This is not, I, you know, I can't get uh, into partisan politics here, but or my own election. It's an official town hall, but. I will say this, and it's public record, you know, I, I did hold a kickoff event for uh, re-election in 2020. Last year. Uh, I had more people turn out than ever before, by over 500 people, uh, because they've noticed that the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, again, this is public information, has targeted me since January and has recruited someone other than our friend, Art Robinson. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there's all that. Uh, so I'm, I'm committed to uh, attempting to uh, get reelected to serve another two years and see uh, hopefully a change in Washington DC and in the White House during that time. Uh, after that, I, don't, I will you know, I take them two years at a time, but Oregon is going to get a sixth congressional seat uh, after uh, the census. Uh, we missed last time by 14,000 citizens. Uh, voters. So uh, we came very close and so we all have unusually large districts. I mean there are people who represent districts you know with 500, 600,000 people in them. Uh, our districts are close to 800,000 people so uh, my district or this district whatever it is will be quite considerably smaller which makes it a little easier to represent people because if you're only representing you know 600,000 or 640,000 versus you know close to 800,000. That's good. Uh, and secondly, uh, it means that uh, you know things will change one way or another uh, in terms of redistricting. Right now, I have one of the very few swing. There's only a, there's less than probably 50 districts that can be D or R because of gerrymandering. And uh, you know, I'm actually on federal legislation to do away with gerrymandering. I would be comfortable having uh, citizen commissions do redistricting for the House of Representatives nationwide. There are a number of states that do this, uh, and the results are pretty good. Uh, one of the problems with polarization in Washington, for the House anyway, there's a whole, I have a whole speech on this, but I'll just give this a little bit. For the House, the most, uh, the greatest cause is gerrymandering of districts which means packing districts in, to, in a way that changes, uh, you know, I mean, it, it put, it's trying to put all the Democrats in one district and then create more Republican districts. If, you, if you're the Republican legislature and governor or the same thing has happened on, in Democratic states. California had a famous redistricting uh, back 20 years ago. I mean, where one guy's district was only connected by a rail line along the waterfront to another part of his district. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it, it, both parties have been guilty of it. California had an initiative and went to a citizen uh, redistricting uh, back in uh, 2000, uh, yeah, in, in 2012, uh, well, 2010 election, 2012, and they had more turnover in Congress than they'd had in the last decade. Uh, and they put Democrats in with Democrats, Republicans in with Republicans, 
and it was, you know, it changed uh, characteristics to some extent, not totally, but it makes things less partisan because if you come from a deep blue district, your whole uh, focus is on your primary election. If you come from a deep red district, same thing. If you come from a purple district like I do, you have to be a little more attentive across the political spectrum. It doesn't mean you can't have opinions or you can't be a member of a party, but it just tempers things. So, uh, and there are graphs that show this, uh, that what's happened over the last 30 years. We used to have two, uh, two parabolas that w one went over here and one went over here, and this was a liberal Republican, this was a conservative Democrat, and everybody in the middle there you know, was a mix of Democrats and Republicans. Now those lines don't even meet anymore. Uh, so uh, that has been very poisonous to the atmosphere in the House. There are many other reasons for uh, extreme partisanship, but that's one. So uh, that will change in Oregon uh, in 2000, uh, 2020 legislature. Uh, we will have a sixth seat, and how they will redraw the seats will be interesting to observe, and, and then I'll think about whether that makes my district uh, winnable by somebody else, or you know, winnable by me, or so bad that I'm not gonna want to deal with it. So who knows, we'll see what happens. So anyway, uh, it's about five after six. I've been going since pretty early today, and I got an early day tomorrow, and all the way back up the coast. And then I don't know if I get no, I don't get home tomorrow night. I'm in Coos Bay tomorrow night, and then I get home the next night. So anyway, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time.